Okay, so first of all, let me uh, let me just say a few words about the Learning Hub uh, because I prepare a lot of material for this particular course. It's divided by day, uh, so you have access to a PDF uh, for each day, uh, and then you have uh, uh, two source uh, uh, two source code. The one is the R script, which is uh, what we we are going to use. The other thing is the R markdown. Uh, so if you um, well, first of all, let, let's open R Studio, which is the, the software we are going to use for this particular lecture. Uh, on the VLE, it should be in a folder called Applications on your desktop. Uh, and uh, the, the icon is, is uh, it's an R, so you can just click on it. And it should open R Studio, which is the uh, interpreter for R. Have you have you all opened it? Uh, so basically, R Studio, as I said, it's it's an interpreter software, and uh, basically it has a series of of tabs. Uh, we will look into what each of these tab uh, does uh, later on. Uh, for the time being, I would like to just uh, uh, look at one of the source code uh, I prepare, which are the, the .rmd files. You actually need to open them, but basically this is, uh, um, this is a software uh, called R Markdown, which is basically a, uh, a mix between R and LaTeX. LaTeX is it's a programming language for, for, pre for writing documents. And um, um, basically here, what you can do is uh, um, not just uh, running R code, but you can create uh, uh, the, the documents you, you have in, in PDF. So uh, uh, every time you, if, for example, if you want to, to create a report or a master thesis, this is one way of doing it. Clearly, you don't have to do it if you don't want it, but it will save you a lot of time in the long run because uh, every time you run a piece of code, um, well, R will uh, or R Studio will interpret it and then uh, uh, show the output directly on uh, um, the report, so you don't have to, uh, for example, include plots or copy and paste from from R to to Word or whatever. Uh, I included a lot of uh, of information in the PDF, so with links about what R Markdown is and uh, the basic syntax. Uh, I will not cover everything in, in details because, as I said, the, the, these, these lectures are already a, a bit dense. Uh, but just so you know that, uh, that that's what I used for uh, uh, for creating the, these PDFs. Um, so basically, in this lecture, uh, I will go through a, an introduction on R. Uh, I will cover data structure and data types, uh, subsetting, and then I will cover the, the part about importing data. And then we do some descriptive statistics and plotting. So now, if you if you want, uh, if you can please open uh, the script number one. It's called day one dot r. So basically, this is the, uh, the sorts of the sort of translation of what we saw before in uh, in the R markdown. So again, you have all the text, but you also have uh, the R code, which can be uh, can be evaluated as a normal R script. So the first uh, piece of code you see in uh, uh, in the script is uh, is this one. So. Uh, this is basically what is called an assignment call. Uh, so basically in this call, what we are doing is we are applying a function. The function is called R norm. Uh, and this function um, is used to um, extract uh, um, a, a number of samples from a normal distribution. So in this case, we are, uh, we are creating an object with 20, uh, 20 samples, so 20 numbers that comes from a norm normal distribution with mean equal to 4 and standard deviation equal to 1. So if we just run part of this line, so just the function, 
we will obtain a series of numbers. This is called a vector. So basically, a vector is, is just uh, a certain data type, uh, which is basically a, an array of, uh, of, it can be numbers, it can be strings, it can be whatever you lo want. If you, if you actually run uh, the, the whole line, so if we, if we either select it, the, the whole line, or if we just click on at the, at the very end and we click Run, uh, then the, the assignment call will create an object name A. And the object will be stored in your global environment. So then you, you, you will see the object appear in your, in your environment. If you want to just print uh, the, the values on the object A, you can just uh, type A and then run it. Uh, one thing you will notice is that the, the second set of numbers is different from the first. And this is because the, the function R norm, every time you run it, will create a, a different set of numbers. Uh, this sort of function is extremely useful for simulation. So if you want to run a simulation that basically extracts random numbers for a normal distribution, uh, this function is extremely helpful. We will use a number of simulation in this course uh, to demonstrate some of the statistical theory behind inferential statistics. So all this function will, will, uh, will be very useful in this course. Uh, so yeah, in this case, it's a vector of, of 20 elements, not 40 elements, um, that are randomly sampled from, from a normal distribution. If, we, if you want to check uh, the, the number of elements within a vector, you can run the function length and then check the number of, uh, of elements. In this case, it's 20 because we created a vector with 20 elements. Um, I mean, R is based all around functions. So I mean, every time you want to run something, um, there are a series of functions that, that you, you need to know. And, uh, and this is probably the most challenging part about R, because there's, uh, I mean, sometimes you just need to memorize functions. So if, uh, if you want to do a sum, there's a function named sum. If you want to run the mean, there's a function named mean. So clearly, you need to know these, these names. Uh, uh, clearly, in, in this course, we will use a number of these functions, uh, and uh, clearly you, you have access to all the PDFs, so you will, uh, you will have access to all the functions. But sometimes uh, uh, it's a bit difficult to know what, fu what function does what you need to do, uh, and, uh, and it's, it's difficult for me. I mean, sometimes when, I do, when I'm, I'm doing stuff, it's, it's difficult to know what, what function to use. One thing I normally do is I just Google. Uh, I do a Google search or R, and then just type what you want to do, and often, I mean, you, you find the answer because clearly, because it's it's a, it's an open source, uh, it's used by a, a lot of people around the world. So, uh, I mean, maybe ninety percent of the time you find your answer. Um, Sorry, is this a sort of bug? Uh, yeah. Like <laughs> I'll try to cut it from the video. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, so basically, um, as you saw from the PDF, uh, there are a series of, uh, of data types uh, you have in, uh, in R. So vectors is the, is the basic one, which is simply a, a, an array of numbers. And then you have a, a series of, of other data types. We will, uh, we will look particularly into matrices and data frames and lists. Array, it's, it's a 3D data types. Uh, and uh, to be honest, I never used it, so I'm, I'm not going to show it now. Uh, but just so you know, it's, it's, it's part of the R package. Um, yeah, and, and I think that it's, it's important to understand about R, uh, because it's, uh, it's, it happens all the time uh, with, um, uh, with all the elements. And uh, it doesn't matter if it's a, a 1D object, a 2D object, like a, a data frame or a 3D object like, a, uh, like an array, every time you want to run an operation, the operation will be run element-wise. So for example, in this case, we have a vector name A with 20 elements. We already saw that uh, it has 20 elements. If we run this line, so if we, if we just say A plus 3, this function will add the, the, the number 3 to each element of the vector. So in this case, we are running another assignment call, and we are assigning this new vector uh, to an object named B. Okay, so again, if you if you want, for example, to do B uh, plus A, again, this will be 
will be done element-wise. So each element of the vector b will be uh, added to the each element of, of vector a. And again, this works for 1D object, 2D object, etc. So the first 2D object, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's the matrix. Um, again, matrix is, uh, is uh, the same thing that you get, you get from, for example, in, in an Excel sheet. So it's just a, a series of rows and columns. Uh, so in this case, we are creating a matrix with uh, eight rows and, and five columns. And we are using a vector to actually fill this, uh, this matrix. And the, uh, the vector is, uh, uh, is uh, called with uh, this simple function. So in this case, it's just the vector from 1 to 40. So if we just run this part of the line, then you will get a series of numbers starting from 1 and, and finish at 40. So again, uh, we are creating an object, because this is an assignment call, we are creating an object named M. But clearly, you can take a look at the matrix just by running part of the line. So in this case, it's just creating a matrix with 40 elements. And again, it's, it's eight rows and five columns. Uh, and again, if you want to create the object, you just need to run the full line. And then you can print it. Before, we just, we just used, uh, we, we just um, write uh, the, the name of the object and then run. Uh, another way of printing what's inside an object is just use the function print, um, which it does exactly the same thing. Um, yeah, it, for, for matrix, uh, it's particularly important to understand the order in which R fills the matrix. Because, for example, as you, as you can see in this first matrix, uh, from number 1 to number 8, it, uh, R basically filled the first column and then switched to the second column and then filled, filled the, the, the second, the third, etc. If we want to change that, we need to use a, a different option, so the option by row. So again, if we just run these other lines just partially, then you can see that uh, the order uh, in which the, the, the numbers were input in the matrix changes. Uh, that's uh, extremely important, for example, if you're, if you're running loops and you want to store your results in a matrix, because clearly uh, sometimes uh, you don't really need to check what you've created afterwards, because maybe it's, it's, a, it's a large object, so you need to know exactly what R is doing in the background, because otherwise it will create issue when, when, you, uh, when you do your, your, uh, your analysis, your, your follow-up analysis. Another extremely important function, particularly if you, if you are starting now to, l to learn R, is the help function. And the help function basically is, again, it, it, it's, it's the same thing as all the other functions. So you just uh, need to write the name of the function, open square brackets, and then put the name of any other function you want to, you want to, um, to, to know more about. So in this case, just run help function, and then uh, RStudio is particularly useful because in the um, lower right tab, you have a series of, uh, of sub-tabs, and one of these sub-tabs is the help page. So the help page uh, will, will open in the, same, uh, in the same main window. So you, then you can, you can actually see what, uh, uh, what you need to, to, to look for in this particular, um, in this particular function. Another form of uh, 2D object is uh, a data frame. So the, the main difference between a data frame and, uh, and a matrix is that uh, a matrix, uh, I mean, first of all, a matrix is composed by elements of the same type. So if it's a numerical matrix, it's, to, it's all number. If it's a string matrix, it's all strings, etc. A data frame can be a mix of uh, uh, numerical, strings, uh, categorical variables, whatever. Uh, another important uh, uh, distinction between data frames and matrices is that the data frame is uh, a, a 2D object with the column uh, have a particular name. So it's exactly the same as uh, an Excel sheet. So you can have first column name uh, number one or, or whatever. Uh, and then you can recall on, on uh, different columns by name, which is extremely important. So in this case, for, for this particular um, um, uh, example, I will use a, a data set. 
um, which is already available within uh, base R, which is the iris dataset. And so if we just run the function head, so the function head basically extracts the first, uh, uh, let's say, six, six lines. I think it depends on the object. But uh, yeah, in this case, it's the first six lines from uh, the data frame. Uh, so it, it allows you to actually see what's inside the data frame without printing it all, because clearly this data frame is much larger. So if, we, if I just run the, the word iris, as you can see, it's under 150 rows. Uh, so if you want to, for example, know the name of each row, if you just run this line, then you need to scroll up to, to number one and then look at the names. If you use the, the function head, then you can just see the, the, the name of the function and what is more or less the, the type of data within each column. So for example, in this case, I have the first four columns with numerical variables. The last one, it's, uh, it's a categorical variable. Uh, in R, it's called the factorial variable. Another way of actually looking at the structure of a data frame is, is by using the, the, the function str, which stands for, for structure. So again, the, the, the function can, can be used in the same way. You just call the function, open round brackets, and then include the name of the data frame. And in this case, it will tell you that this data frame has 150 observations, so 150 rows, and five variables, so five columns. And then it will also tell you the name of each of these columns, what is the data type of, of each column. So again, we, we have four numerical variables, and we have a categorical variable, so a factor. Other type of data that you can, you can have in a data frame are lo logical. So again, some, sometimes you have either true or false. Uh, and, and you can also have strings. So for example, if you have uh, like a date, um, I mean, sometimes data are treated as strings, or you just, just a name, or you want to identify something. Then, then st and, and string are, are uh, identified by the, the quotation mark. Uh, so the, the last object uh, I'm going to, to show, which is one of the main one, is a list. So again, if we go back to uh, the PDF, so lists are uh, um, objects that are a bit more complex compared to what we saw now. Uh, because lists basically are, uh, as the word suggests, are lists of objects. So in a list, you can have, for example, one element uh, uh, that is a data frame. Another element could be a vector. Another element could be a matrix. Or it could be a mix of those. Um, so clearly, I mean, they are very handy, particularly, again, if you, if you want to collect results, uh, because the, you, you can just copy and paste everything. You don't really need to. Um, to you know, uh, be concerned about the, the type of data you're, you're just putting there. Uh, you can just collect everything in there. Uh, but they are a bit more difficult uh, just because, uh, um, and I'll show you later when we do subsetting, they have, they have two levels of subsetting. So now, uh, because we have uh, two objects, uh, one is the object A, which again is a vector of 20 elements. Uh, another object is object M, which we created before, which is a matrix. So now we can create a list uh, of uh, two elements uh, with, with both objects. So again, if I just run part of this uh, line, then you will see that, uh, for example, this is, this is a list between A and M. And again, there is the, this is the first element of the list. Uh, and it's identified by these two square brackets. So the first element of the list is a vector. The second element of the list is a matrix. So again, if we, cre if we create the object L by just running the, the line, then we can print it out. And again, it's, uh, it, it, will, it will show the same thing. So let me. OK, so now importing data. Uh, if you go back on the Learning Hub, um, you will see that I created a, an additional folder with uh, some data sets. Uh, so uh, again, th these are all the data we, we will use. Uh, so we have uh, uh, the, the data oats.csv is one of the data sets that's included in your assignment. Uh, in particular, in this lecture, uh, in the first three lectures, we will use, uh, I think, the diet, no, the crime data set, which is uh, 
uh, this data set here, so crime.csv. Uh, so we have several ways to, to import data in R. Uh, normally, what you do is uh, you download the data set. So for example, in this case, uh, I've downloaded it. Uh, Where is it? Okay. So now I have I have opened the, the CSV. We can save it, uh, for example, in in my personal folder. Okay. Let's create an additional folder. It's called R course. CSV. Uh. Yes. Okay. So now in my personal folder, there should be a uh, subfolder named R course and then crime dot uh, CSV. Okay. So uh, one one way there are, again there are several ways to open objects in in R. One way uh, that is is common is to actually use uh, um, is, is is by setting your working directory, uh, and the way to do that is to use the function set wd, which stands for setting working directory. Uh, again, as you can see, this function takes a string with the link uh, to the folder where you store the, your data. So in this case, I can just delete this and then copy this link uh, directly from from windows so just just copy the the uh, the address where i store my data so i can just copy copy it here the the only thing you need to remember when you do that is to change the slash to a forward one because otherwise it doesn't work and then you can you can run it and then r as uh, as now um set the working directory. So for example, if I just, instead of using this line, because um, yeah, this line is directly from the website, if I just use the function read CSV without specifying any location of the file, just the name of the file, so in this case, uh, uh, the name would be uh, crime with a capital C dot CSV. Because I've set the working directory, then R will know where to find this this file so if i just if i just use the name of the file then yeah it should it should work so again the the data frame is stored in your environment and you can see it up here uh, if you click on the arrow then you can see the structure of your of your data frame again you can use the function str uh, to do the same uh, it's exactly the same thing you, you can just you can just use it whatever you like <coughs> okay, so one uh, one thing I'm, I'm noticing now is that in this new data set, the, the first um, variable is called crime rate. In the data set I downloaded from uh, Sheffield, because this is a data set that is distributed for free by Sheffield University, uh, the, the variable was the, um, was read uh, in in a different format with this sort of uh, um, yeah sort of, of symbols at the beginning. Uh, this is actually good because uh, uh, all the lines I, I've written afterward will not work, so we need to be changed. Uh, so I, I will show you how to actually do that. Um, so yeah, basically in this uh, uh, this data frame, it's 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 simple data frame with uh, a crime rate and a, and a series of uh, other variables uh, which which can be used an, as an explanatory variables uh, to explain uh, the variance in, in crime rate. Um, you can have a look at the uh, at the link provided in the PDF to have a, a full description of of the data set. Uh, yeah, clearly there are other ways to, to import data in R. Uh, I usually find that the, the, the best way is from CSV because they don't really change much 
from computer to computer, so that's what, what I normally use. Even though, <coughs> for example, in my computer at home, because it's in Italian, the CSV is separated by a semicolon, not, not a comma. Uh, so you, you, need to, you need to be a, a bit careful. Uh, but usually CSV is a standardized format, so I, I found it it's a, a, bit, a bit easier to actually import data in CSV. However, R can import data from uh, text files, uh, uh, Excel sheet, uh, whatever. So, and there are a series of other functions to do that. Uh, and again, I included a couple of links uh, for you to look at uh, with additional um, uh, resources to actually import data from, from different formats. Um, so, okay, now we can start with the uh, descriptive statistics. Um, yeah, again, one uh, a bit of, uh, of, um, of ex explanation about this part of the code. Uh, again, this, this is written in LaTeX, and this is the way LaTeX uh, um, creates uh, equations. So, for example, if you, if you look at page, uh, yeah, one of those pa the pages in, in, the, in the PDF, you'll see that uh, uh, you will have a series of equations, and, and the, the way uh, later create this equation is by using these dollar signs. Uh, so clearly it doesn't really go look good in, in the code, but actually it, it is, uh, it is quite handy when you want to create some, um, uh, some, some reports. Uh, and again, I included uh, a, a reference on how to create uh, a equation in LaTeX in, in the note. Uh, so, I mean, uh, clearly you should know what, uh, how to um, manually um, calculate the mean of a data set. So the mean is just the sum of all the values. Let me scroll down to the script statistics. Okay. So this is the way you, you, you calculate the, the mean. Uh, I mean, clearly, you want, if you want, you can do it manually, but in R, there is a function which is called mean. <coughs> so again, we go back to the whole thing about you having to know the, the name of each function. I mean, sometimes they are self-explanatory, so mean clearly uh, means that you, you, can, you can create the mathematical average of a series of numbers. Uh, in some other cases, uh, they are a bit more difficult. So for example, standard deviation is SD. Uh, so again, you need to know uh, what is the name of each function. So for example, in this case, let's say you want to create uh, uh, the mean of uh, uh, the variable crime rate. So first of all, we need to extract, so subset uh, the uh, data frame, uh, and the data frame is called crimes. Uh, so we need to subset, so extract all the numerical values contained in the, uh, in the columns crime rate. So again, b because we saw it, how to do it, uh, it's, it's just you write the name of the object uh, and then with a dollar sign uh, and you just type uh, the crime rate. So again, if you, if you just run this part of the code, it will just print out the, the full vector of values contained within the, the, the first uh, column of, uh, of the file. And uh, because it's, it's, a, it's a vector and the function mean takes a vector as, as input, then you can just calculate the mean, uh, which is uh, 102.80. Same thing is for the median. So again, I just need to <coughs> change this value, because clearly the name of this particular object is, is different, but it's the same thing. So you just call the function median, you open square brackets, and you input the numerical vector you want to, to calculate the median from. And again, it will tell you the uh, the, the, the median of, uh, um, of, the, of, of this particular numerical vector. So now, uh, the measure of spread. So again, we are talking about descriptive statistics. So everything, the, the descriptive statistics, is, it's a general term that, uh, that um, um, encompasses all the indexes you can use to describe the data set. Um, so I mean, you should know that more or m most times what you want to, to used to compare data set is the measure of centrality, which can be a mean or the median, uh, a measure of spread, uh, it can be the variance of the standard deviation. And then, and this is particularly important for inferential statistics, the standard error of the mean. 
which is again extremely important. We will see why uh, later on. So again, for calculating the spread, as I said, we have two different uh, uh, ways. So one, th one, we can, one thing we can use is the variance, uh, which again is, uh, uh, is the sum of square differences between each observation and the mean. So you, you are actually calculating what is the distance, so the difference between each value in your data set and the mean. Um, and in R, this is, this is fairly easy, so you just use the function var, which stands for, for variance, um, and, and you just run it. So in this case, I just need to change this object, and you just run it, and this is the variance. The standard deviation is simply the square root of the variance. So again, if, uh, the, the, and there is a function for that, which is the function SD, and, and this will just compute the standard deviation. So clearly, I mean, because it's the, it's the square root of the standard of, of the variance, we can, if we want, we can just use the square root function, which is SQRT, <coughs> and then copy and paste the, the variance. So again, what we are doing now is we are uh, um, nesting two functions together. So first of all, R will solve the, the inner function, so it will compute the variance of this numerical values, and then we calculate the square root. And then clearly, I mean, the, the, uh, the result is the same as calculating the, 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 the standard deviation. It's just that we did it in a, in a different way. Another important uh, um, function uh, in R is the function summary. Uh, and uh, if you apply <coughs> the function summary, for a data frame, it will return a series of descriptive statistics for each of the columns uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the data frame. So for example, it will return the minimum value for each column. So in this case, the minimum value from the column crime rate. It will compute the median, the mean, the maximum values, and then the first and third uh, quartiles. So what are the, uh, the quartiles? So uh, basically, if we go back to the PDF, <coughs> we talk about uh, quantiles uh, when we describe a distribution. And, and quantiles are simply cut points that define uh, probability values in a distribution. So for example, in this case, we have uh, the 78th percentile. And uh, the, what, what one thing that needs to be clear is that quantile is a general term. Uh, so quantile uh, um, means uh, that a series of cut points to the distribution. And uh, the number of time you actually cut the distribution, then it will identify the, the terms you use. So if you, if you want to cut the distribution in four parts, then you will talk about quartiles. If you want to cut it in, a, in 100 parts, then you will talk about percentiles. Uh, if you want to cut it in 10, in ten parts, then it's, it's deciles uh, and, and, and so on. So in this case, you have the 78th percentile, and uh, this will uh, cut the distribution in, in two probability classes. So before the 78th percentile, you have uh, um, a, 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 a 78th probability of, uh, in this case, is, is, is um, a, a student score, so student performing below this point, and then clearly 21% scoring above this point. So the quantiles are, are important for uh, creating this class of probability. However, they are also uh, <coughs> extremely important when you have uh, non-normal distributions. Because when you have a normal distribution, then you can calculate the standard deviation, you can calculate the variance, you can calculate the standard error of the mean, no problem. However, when you have a, a distribution that is not, is not normal, so for example, you have a log normal distribution or a distribution that is very skewed, and it happens quite often, uh, these values cannot really be used um, because they were created with the normal distribution in mind. Uh, so the way you, for example, you will uh, um, we report um, a measure of spread for non-normal distribution is by using the interquartile range. So calculated the distance between the first and the third quartile. And that, that is the, 
uh, more or less the same, uh, the same as the standard deviation. So the, um, the, the, the values between the first and the third quartile uh, represent around 50-57% of, um, of the values included in the probability, which is exactly the same as the standard deviation. But it's a way that you, you, you can represent spread also when you have non-normal distribution. And in R, calculating the, the interquartile range is quite easy. Again, we, we have a function. It's called IQR. So you, you can, again, just input the, the, um, um, the, 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 the vector, and then we, it will calculate. One thing I would like to, to point out here is that R is case sensitive. So for example, in this case, uh, the function is called IQR with capital letters. If you input the, 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 same, um, the same function in uh, not in capital, it will return an error because this function doesn't exist. Okay, So it, it cannot find the function because this function doesn't exist. It, it exists only in capital letters. And the same is true for other things. So if, he, for example, if the object is called crimes with a capital C, if I try to call the object crimes uh, without the capital C, it will say that uh, it cannot find it. Because so, so you need to be extremely careful of, uh, about the names you, you provide and, the, uh, and all the function. OK, okay so uh, the next phase is subsetting. So as I said before, subsetting is very much dependent on the type of object you have. So for example, um, vectors are uh, objects with one dimension. So it's just lists of things. So clearly, when you want to subset um, a, a list of numbers, the only thing you need to provide to R is the ID to identify which numbers in this array you want to extract. And the way to extract numbers from objects is to use square brackets. So for example, in this case, as you can see, we have the vector a, and then we open the square brackets, and we put the number 1. So in this case, what I'm saying is to extract the first element of the vector a. So if I just show you the whole vector, so the first element is uh, 3.58 something. So if I just run this line, then of course, uh, the, the result would be just one number, which is the first element of this vector. Um, if I want to extract the last element, because we, we, we saw how to use the function length, so, so the function length provides you with the, uh, the number of elements inside this vector, so the function length in this case will output the number 20, because we know there are 20 elements. So for example, if I run this line, then the, the, the element number 20 in this vector is 1.35. So if I just run this line, then sure enough, I will get the number 1.35. So this is the, 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 um, the subsetting you can do with 1D elements. Clearly, when you move to the next type of objects, the next type of objects are 2D elements. So clearly, the, the, the amount of subsetting is a bit different, because you need to provide uh, an ID for each of the two dimensions. So in this case, you need to provide for, for a matrix, you need to provide an ID for uh, rows, which is the first element, and columns. <coughs> and the way to do that is, again, opening square brackets and then uh, separating the two elements uh, with a comma. So again, if I just show you the whole uh, matrix, in this case, I'm extracting the element in the third row which is this one, and column number 5. So again, it, it will probably give me uh, element number 35, which is exactly what, what I get. The same thing is true for uh, data frames. So again, we have the data frame name Iris. I want to extract the element at uh, uh, row number 4 and column number 4. So again, if I just run it, it will start the zero, the, a number called 0 0.2. And, and then if I, if I just look again at the head of this data set, then number 4, element 4, is this 0 0.2 here. <coughs> we can extract multiple elements by, from, from 2D objects by including multiple 
uh, rows. So again, in this case, uh, we are extracting from row 1 to row 4. So again, we are, we are using a vector of numbers. So this is a vector of integer, 1, 2, 3, 4, to extract values from column 2. So again, we will extract values 3.4, 3.0, 3.2, 3.1. And this is another, th another thing you can do. Uh, as I said, uh, from um, data frame, this is something I, I didn't cover in the, in the PDF, but from data frame, you can actually extract uh, entire rows by name. So for example, if I use uh, iris, uh, and then the dollar sign, and then uh, the, the good thing about RStudio is that we, it will suggest the name of the columns uh, within this data frame. So if I select one of those columns, uh, R will extract all the elements, so it, again, it will, it will create a vector of numerical elements by extracting an entire column from a data frame, uh, which, again, is something that is it's particularly useful for, uh, uh, particularly when you have uh, data maybe from a CSV or something. <coughs> Another way you can extract entire rows or entire columns uh, is by omitting one of the two indexes. Uh, so for example, in this case, I'm omitting the, the second index. So I'm not including any index for columns, uh, just, uh, just an index for, uh, for rows, uh, then comma and nothing. And in this case, what I'm saying is to extract the entire row number one. So again, if I just look at the, um, at the matrix, I will just tell R to extract these rows. And again, it will create uh, a numerical vector. The same thing can be done for, for uh, columns. So in this case, I'm just saying to R to extract only the column number three. So just, just this value here. OK. Oh, yeah. And that's the, um, the way you to do uh, extraction by name in, in data frames. So as I said uh, before, lists are uh, complex objects. Because clearly, the fact that you have different type of objects uh, including a list, <coughs> creates, uh, oh, let me, uh, so yeah, the fact that you have uh, uh, multiple objects of different types uh, within a list uh, uh, makes it a bit difficult. Uh, and, um, and basically, to subset a list, you need to provide two levels of extraction. And uh, the first level of extraction, uh, because we, we actually saw when we printed out the object, uh, then the two, uh, the two elements in the list were identified by two square brackets and, and an ID. So actually, the way to extract, for example, the first element uh, within a list is to actually use the, the two square brackets, so the same way. And then you say you, you uh, type the two square brackets, and you just provide the elements. So in this case, if I want to extract the first element, I just provide the number one. Otherwise, it's, it's the number two, because it's, it's just two elements. Uh, a way to uh, actually know the number of elements in, uh, so the number of objects nested in a list is to actually use the function length. And again, this will, will tell you exactly how many, how many objects you have in, in the list. So now, for example, in this case, uh, um, the, the first call, as you, as you saw, uh, it extracts the whole vector we, we actually inputted. So now, we, if, let's say we want to extract a particular element from this object in, in, uh, in place one of this, of this list. So what we can do is include an additional level of extraction. So after we say which element of the list we want to extract, then we say which element in the first object of the list we want to extract. So in this case, it will be, again, elements 1, so number 1 in, in the vector. So again, it will return the same number, 3.58. And again, the same is true for, for the data frame. And now we, we, are, we are extracting the second object. So in this, yeah, in this case, it's a matrix. The data frame will be the same. So in this case, we are extracting the same um, the, the second <coughs> element in the list. And if we want to add a further extraction, then of course, because it's a 2D object, we need to use the same sort of subset that we, uh, we saw uh, before. So again, if I want to extract row number three and column number five, then I just need to input a, a second level of extraction. OK. 
So now we will do um, we will cover the part about plotting. I mean, as I said at the beginning, uh, I'm not pretending to actually uh, covering everything about plotting because uh, there's there's a lot of ground to cover. It's uh, it would be a, an entire course of itself. Uh, but uh, I, I, I thought that uh, it is important for you to learn the basics of plotting because clearly when you do uh, data analysis, uh, um, descriptive statistics and plotting can really help you understand uh, what's going on uh, in, in your data set. Um, so I, I thought about just, just doing something um, to, to show you how to, to create basic plots like histograms, scatter plots, uh, uh, box plot, etc. So we will start from histograms. Uh, so histograms are uh, the, the, the basic type of plot that you use to um, show a distribution. Um, so for example, you want to uh, normally when you start an inferential statistics, uh, for example, you want to run a t-test or you want to run an ANOVA, uh, one of the assumptions is the assumption of normality. So clearly understanding if your data is normally distributed, it's important because it will allow you to make a series of decisions. We will we will clearly look at uh, more in details about this decision uh, when, when we cover the inferential statistics part. Uh, but for the time being, I, I will show you how to create an histogram. So again, the histogram is, is, is extremely simple to create. You just need to divide your data into non-overlapping bins, which are simply ranges of numbers. And you simply count the number of, uh, of elements contained with these ranges. So for example, if I show you um, a simple histogram of the variable crime rate, and again, uh, in our studio, all the plots are uh, uh, printed out in, in, the, in, the, in the bottom left section. So again, you have, you have a sub-tab with plots. Uh, so if you want to go back to help, then you, you can do it, but you also have a, a sub-tab plot. So every time you, you plot something, it will be shown in the main window. So for example, in this case, you will see that you have, you have this, uh, these bars, and uh, each bar consists of the frequency so the number of elements within each bin. So for example, in this case, you have a, a bin from 40 to 60. And it says here that you should have three elements. So we can, we can just check that by sorting uh, the numerical vector. So we, if, we can use, if we use the function sort to actually sort the numbers within the, the vector crime rate, so if I just run this line, then you could see that for from 40 to 60, not 60 uh, below 60, you have three elements, and this is this is exactly what what the histogram is plotting, and you can check all the others. So, for example, from 60 to 80, you have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight numbers. So again, the 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 eighth, the height of the bar is the number eight, uh, so it uh, is the frequency. So again. Um, Plotting a histogram, even, even doing it manually, would be extremely easy. However, uh, this sort of, uh, of plots is extremely important uh, because, again, it allows you to actually uh, look at, uh, at the shape of, of your distribution. So for example, in this case, uh, this distribution has this particular bell shape, which is very similar to what we uh, saw before when we, when we look at this particular uh, distribution, so this is a, clearly a normal distribution. So the fact that your distribution, so your histogram, looks similar to this distribution, so it has a, a, a very nice bell shape, allows you to uh, conclude that uh, with, uh, there's a good probability, a good chance that this distribution will, uh, will be a normal distribution. And most of the time, uh, just eyeballing the distribution is more than enough to actually justify why you, why you want to do a, a certain test. We will, we will look at the more, let's say, robust way of, uh, uh, of, uh, of assessing normality when we do the inferential statistics. But this is the, a, a very nice way of doing it. So one thing you can notice about this particular plot uh, is that uh, I mean, the title is not particularly informative. 
because it's just say histogram of, and then you have uh, a sort of piece of code with the name of your <coughs> of your data frame and the dollar sign. As the sa and the same is true for the, the label on the, on the x-axis. Um, so one thing I wanted to, to show you now is how to modify these two elements. And again, it's extremely simple. You just need to add two additional options within the call to the function ist, which is uh, the option main, which stands from main title. And then you just input a string with the, the, the title you want to, to say. So in this case, it's just histogram crime rates. And then another option is xlab, uh, which basically allows you to modify uh, the, the label of the x-axis. <coughs> so again, if we, if we run this line, then you will see that the two, uh, the two labels for the main titles and the, 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 the x-labs, the, the x-label have changed. Clearly, you can, you can specify whatever string you want. I mean, uh, within, uh, within the quotation mark, you can say whatever you like. So for example, in this case, uh, I even included square brackets to say, number of fences per, per million population. So, I mean, you, you can really be specific. Um, so the, the second type of, uh, of plots I want to, to show is, is bar charts. Again, uh, bar charts, uh, uh, they are clearly a bit dif different from histogram. And uh, please do not confuse the, the two. Uh, histogram are um, related to showing uh, the, the shape of the distribution. You, you still create bars, but they are not the same as, uh, as the bar you created in bar charts. Um, however, bar charts, um, particularly for inferential statistics, uh, are useful to actually detect uh, differences between groups. So most of the time when you are running an ANOVA or a t-test, you are interested in, uh, um, in maybe looking at uh, differences between, uh, let's say, um, two different groups of, of variable or treatments. Let's say you apply two different treatments to, to something. You want to see if the, the treatment has, has created a difference in your, in your dependent variable. Uh, so one thing you can do is to just graphically create a bar chart and, and see if there are differences between the two bars. Um, so in this case, let's say you want to, to create a bar chart of uh, the mean value for uh, the, um, the value crime rate um, divided by uh, another, um, another variable, which is the, the variable southern. So if we just uh, take a look at the variable southern, uh, this is simply a, a vector of zeros and one. Uh, the, so in, in this particular data set, the variable southern is one if the crime was committed in a, in a southern state of the US and zero otherwise. So let's say we want to see if there is a difference between uh, southern state and, and northern state in, in the US. So first of all, we need to create uh, mean values for, for these two groups. One thing to actually create mean values from uh, groups of uh, um, uh, of, of, uh, so for, for a, a, a continuous variable as for and, and split it depending on a categorical variable is to use the function tapply. So in this case, the function tapply will take uh, the full uh, variable, so the full elements in the vector crime rates, will first split it up into two groups using the, the values in the variable southern, so again, we will create a group for 0 and a group for 1. And then it will calculate the function mean for each of these groups. Again, we can, we can take a look at the help page of this uh, function to apply by just using the, the help function. So if we just run it, then you can see. So for example, this will, it will just give you a short description. I mean, please be aware that in the help pages, uh, most, most of the time, the description of the function are, are very cryptic. So I mean, uh, you don't really find an awful lot of information about the use of, uh, of functions. Uh, however, as I said before, there's a lot of people that publishes material online about R. So if you just Google 
how to do a tutorial on ANOVA or a tutorial about create bar charts or a tutorial about the apply or the apply uh, function that you will find a lot of material with uh, codes and tutorial on, of, on how to, uh, to actually use this, uh, this function. So basically what it says is that uh, you have uh, the, this function takes a series of, of arguments. Uh, so the first is the, um, is the, the argument x which is uh, an atomic object, typically a vector. So you know that uh, in, uh, in the option x, you need to provide a vector. Uh, you know that in the option index, uh, you need to provide uh, factors of the same length as x. So clearly, the, the, the number of elements in, the, in the, 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 the variable you use for index should be the same. Then clearly, in this case, we are not really uh, in, in we are not really inputting a, a, a factorial variable. So what, what it says here is that the elements are coerced to factors, which means that basically this function will take our zeros and one and will convert them to factor. So you can, you can either input directly a factorial variable or it will, it will, turn, it will be turned into a factorial variable. And then there is this uh, option fun, which stands for function, in this case, it's just the function mean. So you just say that we want to compute the mean values. So now we can just run these two lines, and then you can see now what, what the, the, the function has done is compute mean values for both, uh, both groups. So a mean value for 0 and a mean value for 1, which are a bit different. With, so it can be an indication that there are differences between, uh, <coughs> between these two states. So if we just want to plot uh, these two values and, uh, as bars, so again, one bar for uh, the, the group 0 and one bar for group A, we just call uh, the function bar plot. We input the, the, the object we just created, so the object mean. Uh, and then we can uh, add an additional option uh, with the name of the arguments. Because otherwise, the argument will, will just be called 0 and 1. So for example, if I just run uh, the same line, so bar plot with just mean, and then plot this one, as you can see, I mean, I, I create these two bars, uh, but the, the labels are just 0 and 1, which are not particularly informative. So clearly, if we know a bit more about this data set, then we can, uh, we can add the option names argument and ju just say, that uh, 0 is from northern state and, uh, and 1 is from southern state. So then we have, uh, we have additional labels. And, and this clearly becomes a bit, more, a bit more informative for the reader if you are including this in a, in a report. So clearly, it seems that <coughs> there are a bit more crimes in this northern state. Uh, however, um, clearly, I mean, if you really want to, to, know, to know if there is a, a statistically significant difference between these, these, these two groups, then you will need to uh, use a, a formal test. However, there is another way, uh, let's say a more informal way, to actually look at differences uh, between, between groups, uh, which is uh, including in the bar charts the, an error bar. So in this case, in, and we are not including the error bar based on, on the standard deviation. We are including the error bar based on the standard error of the mean. So again, if we, if we scroll down, uh, the standard error of the mean um, is, is simple to, uh, to compute. It's just the, a ratio between the standard deviation and the square root of uh, the number of, uh, of elements in your, uh, in your, uh, in your sample. Uh, however, the, the problem is that there is no function in base R to compute the standard error. So we need to actually write a custom function to compute, co to compute it. So we can, I mean, writing custom function is, is, uh, is not that complex in R. We can just uh, use the, 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 another function is called, it's just simply called function. Uh, and in this case, we can say within uh, round brackets, what the function will take as an input. So in this case, it will take uh, an input x. And uh, in this case, we know that the input x is a vector. 
simply because clearly, I mean, we are creating the function, so we know what uh, what we want to include in this function. But then, uh, um, the 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 way the <coughs> function works is that it will transmit sort of uh, the, the, the 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 input into the, um, the the inner function you use in in the in in uh, in the code uh, you use for create the function. So in this case, because you are calculating the standard deviation and uh, the square root of the length of the elements, so we know that these two functions as input uh, take a vector. So clearly that the x needs to be a vector. And the way you, you include the code is uh, within curly curly brackets. So again, uh, you, you just open the curly brackets, you include the code you want the function to solve every time it, it's called, and then you just run the line. So in this case, again, we are uh, creating a new object, uh, which is called SEM, which, is, which stands for standard error of the mean. And this object is not a vector, it's not a list, but it's a function. So again, we, we, if, if you just if we just call it, then you will, you will uh, R will print out what the function actually looks like. So let's say we want to test this function in, uh, in, 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 in a normal vector, so a, a custom vector that we create. So we, we can just call it SEM, open uh, round brackets, and then say, okay, we want to have a vector, so we, we just used uh, C, which is another function that you can use to uh, to create a vector, and then we just we just add some random numbers. So let's say 23, 45, 76, or whatever. So in this case, we have uh, a vector with these four uh, uh, integers, and then e we we call a function to actually compute the standard error of this vector, and then the function will return an error. So it will solve everything that you've included within the function is just in just one call. So um, why have we created this function? Because, uh, I mean, clearly we, we, we could have just solved uh, the ratio for each group. However, with, uh, with this sort of complex object, creating a simple function will save you a lot of work. So for example, in this case, let's say I want to calculate the standard error of the mean for the two groups we used before. I can, again, use the function tapply. Uh, the function tapply, as we saw before, it takes a, a, a function to calculate whatever you need to, you need it to calculate within each group. So in this case, instead of mean, we can just use the function we created, so the function SEM, within the call to the function tapply. And in this case, it, instead of calculating the mean, it will calculate the standard error of the mean for each of the two groups. Okay, yeah, there is this uh, crime rate, which just takes a, a different. Yeah, so for example, um, actually this error um, error message actually gives me a, a good opportunity to actually show you that the, uh, another thing that is extremely cryptic in R are the error messages. So for example, in uh, this line of code, this line of code return, returned uh, this, this error. So the, 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 the issue with this line of code, because uh, I know what, what the issue was, is that uh, this variable has a different name. Uh, because if I imported the, the, the values from, from the internet, uh, the, the, the variable crime rate took this strange name. Actually, if I import it from, uh, from my hard drive, it just takes the, 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 var the, the value crime rate. So the name was different. So I knew what the, the error was in this particular line. However, what um, what R actually return is argument must have the same length, which has nothing to do with the name of, of the variable. Uh, so that, uh, what, what R is actually saying is that you have uh, uh, the element uh, index with 20 elements, and the element x, because it cannot find it, is 0. However, that's, that's one of the, the challenges is using, in using R, because it's extremely cryptic in the sort of error message it provides. So, I mean, it really takes uh, a while to actually get used to, uh, to all these error messages because there's a lot of debugging that needs to be done by yourself to, uh, when, when you're actually writing code. Because sometimes the error message is, not, is just not something that you can, 
uh, you can identify it quickly. So again, um, if we run uh, this uh, function to apply, we compute the standard error of the mean. Uh, so again, uh, these this two values for those two groups. Uh, and then we can again run the function bar plot. So what I'm doing here is actually uh, running again the function bar plot and uh, changing the option y lim. So y lim stands from uh, the limits of the y axis. This is normally set by default uh, by R uh, using the, the range of, vario of values in your, uh, um, in your variable. So in this case, uh, as you can see in, in the plot we, 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 we plotted before, the, the, the maximum value of, uh, of y would be 100. Uh, because clearly the, the two mean values uh, were, let me find them, the, the maximum one 168, so again probably it's 101, the maximum value on, on the y-axis. But then clearly if you want to actually include the two segments for the error bar, you need to actually increase it, uh, this, this limit a little bit because otherwise the, the two bars will be invisible. Uh, so what I'm doing here is, is simply calling again the bar plot but just increasing the limits the, the, the of the the, the, the y-axis. So again, the, the, the only difference between these two plots, this is before and after, is, is again the, the, the maximum value on the y-axis. So let's say you want to uh, include the, the two error bars. <coughs> and the two error bars will need to have uh, minimum and maximum values related to twice the standard error of the mean because this is the way we compute the 95% uh, confidence intervals. Okay, So the, the way we actually do that in R is to use uh, two additional functions. One is the function segments which again creates two segments in any particular position in the, in the plot window and the function arrow which is actually used to create the two sort of little bars at the top and bottom of, of the error bars. So as I said, this, these bars can be created anywhere on the plot window. So the, the plot window is intended as, as this space. So clearly, you will need to know exactly what are the coordinates of the middle point of this bar and the middle point of this bar. However, you can do it, uh, uh, and, and, and clearly you need to tell R where exactly to plot. So you need to tell him a, a value for x0, so a value for the, the, um, the x when to start the segment, a value for x1, so again the x where to finish the segment, because it clearly it can be uh, an horizontal, a vertical, or oblique segment. So you have uh, an, an, an option for x0 and an option for x1. Clearly in this case, because they are uh, vertical bars, the, the x is exactly the same for x0 and x1. And we can use the call to the function uh, bar plot to actually identify these two, um, these two coordinates. So if, again, if I just run this part of the line, you will see uh, you have a, a little matrix of two values. These two values are actually the, the x coordinates of the middle point of the two bars in the plotting space. So this, this is the x value in the plotting space of these two bars. And then for the, uh, the y value, then clearly this changes and, and it depends on the mean and the standard error. So clearly <coughs> x0 in, is mean minus uh, two times the standard error of the mean and uh, uh, y1 uh, is mean plus twice the standard error of the mean. Because again, we need to, to input this, uh, this range to actually have the 95% confidence interval. Uh, the last option I'm including is LWD, which stands from line width. Uh, so basically here I can just say I want to have a line of uh, 1.5 point, two points, whatever you like. It's up to you. And then the arrows, I just include in a bit more 
so in, in, in actually after line width, then I have the angle. So again, the angle of, of this particular segment. <coughs> the code you actually tells R that you need it, it needs to create uh, horizontal uh, dash lines uh, instead of arrows or whatever. And then the length, uh, which again, it's, it's, it depends on the plot, but more or less 0 0.05 should be fine for this particular um, for this particular plot. So if we just run <coughs> these three lines, uh, then you will see that that R adds two error bars to um, to the bar charts. So as I said, this uh, and again I included the link. Uh, uh, to our blogger, our blogger is uh, is um, a, a platform online where all people that uh, create tutorials for R uh, share their code. So again, if you are uh, uh, if you are struggling with something, and uh, I mean our blogger will probably give you a, a lot of answers. Uh, but I included a, a tutorial in which they 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 discuss about how to build um, uh, this this sort of error bars if you want to learn a bit more. So why? Is this uh, these error bars important? Well, uh, they are important because, as I said, they create the 95% confidence interval, and the 95% confidence intervals um, allows us to know what is, uh, uh, with 95% confidence, uh, what is the range of values in which the true value of the mean lies. Uh, so, for example, let's say that we 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 went out and we sampled uh, I don't know five different uh, plots. Okay, we calculate a mean value, and and we have uh, a mean value of maybe 3.5 or whatever. I mean, clearly, because we just have five five points, our 95 per percent confidence interval will be large, because the the um, the amount of sample is low. So clearly, the 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 true value of that particular population. Uh, will be included in, in this 95% this confidence interval. Uh, and, um, and again, knowing where exactly this true value of the mean lies uh, will really help us when, you, when we do inferential statistics to understand if two groups could be statistically different or, or, not, or not. So for example, in this case, the fact that the two error bars overlap, so they, they share uh, the same values uh, may um, may help us conclude that probably these two groups are not statistically different because their mean value could be exactly the same. Uh, they, th it could be that the, the two value we calculate is just because we, we don't have enough sample to calculate a robust mean. And, and so the, the, the fact that we plot, uh, it, will, uh, it, it, it gives us uh, uh, a good... Uh, um, a good overview of what uh, uh, results from a formal test uh, will look like uh, and also uh, will help us a lot formulate the hypothesis we will need to uh, we will need to use actually the formal test because everything we will do in inferential statistics is called hypothesis testing so clearly first of all we need to formulate our hypothesis and then we can uh, we can start um, we can start doing the, the, the testing so this is one, one way of actually um, checking whether two groups could be different, could be different. And then because this is based on the standard error of the mean, uh, it's only valid for normal distribution, as I, as I said before. For uh, distribution that do not really f uh, follow a normal distribution, I will show you later how to do the exactly the same thing with, uh, with box plots. So another uh, for b before we go to box plots, uh, quickly we can we can go through scatter plots. So scatter plots are uh, um, what we call the multivariate plots, uh, because basically, if I just show you what is the the, um, the output of, the of this function, so basically, uh, scatter plots are a series of of dots, and uh, dots that takes two coordinates, and the two coordinates are related to values of two different variables. So in this case, uh, what I'm, I'm plotting, I'm plotting the, the medium weekly wage as compared to the crime rate. So each of these dots will take a variable related to the median weekly wage and a value related to uh, the crime rate. 
uh, the, the, this sort of plot are, are extremely useful uh, to have an idea of the correlation between variables. So for example, in this case, uh, what we can see is that, again, generally speaking, when the median weekly wage increases, the crime rate also increases. Uh, because clearly um, we have uh, points lower with low median weekly wage and low crime rate around here, and then we, we get the general increase. So this will suggest that there is a, a, what we call a positive correlation between these two variables. Again, we will see uh, when, when we do um, probably linear correlation how to, to better look at this particular type of correlation, but it's important that you know how to uh, to plot, uh, uh, mu to create multivariate plots because again they are extremely useful, particularly in the first stages of your analysis when, when you don't really know uh, what the data set uh, looks like uh, and so you need to formulate this sort of hypothesis. So um, lastly, what, uh, what I would like to show you is box plots. So again, if we, if we go back to Mm. Let's see if I have it here. No. So if we, if we go back to uh, this plot here, so basically, box plots, uh, are you you can consider them as a, a sort of way to uh, depict a distribution, uh, sort of by looking it from above. So instead of just looking at the shape of the distribution, is is like you you see the distribution from from the top. So for example, in this case, uh, the box plots show you the, the median. Uh, so the, the, the sort of thick line in the middle is the median of the distribution. And then you have the actual box, which is the interquartile range. And then you have the two whiskers, uh, which are placed at uh, 1.5 uh, times the interquartile range. So it, they give you a good uh, overview of what is uh, um, the sort of uh, maximum uh, spread around your mean that you, you consider meaningful. Because um, as for the normal distribution, the whisker give you more or less uh, what is the range of values uh, that have uh, sort of 95% probability of, uh, um, of, of, being, uh, of being part of the distribution. Everything that is uh, uh, below uh, or above those two whiskers uh, is are extreme values, uh, and sometimes you can consider them as outliers. Uh, and, and this is something that uh, the, the, the box plot can also tell you. So again, for, for in R, it's extremely um, simple to actually plot, uh, create this box plot. There is just the function box plot. <coughs> and it can be used the same exact way we used all the other functions. So you just call the function, you open your, uh, your round brackets, and you just input the, um, um, in this case, a vector of numbers. So again, we, we want to change the main title. We want to change the, the label of the x axis, axis. So we just run this line, and it will show the, this box plot. So again, this, this plot tells me that this thick line is the median of our of my distribution this is the interquartile range and then this is the the value uh, 1.5 times uh, away from the the interquartile range away from the, the two quartiles <coughs> so uh, another thing i added here uh, i mean it is not really something that uh, is normally done for box plot i just wanted to uh, to show you how to include additional elements in a plot. So for example, in this case, uh, I'm using the function points to add additional element on top of an existing plot. Uh, in this case, I'm adding uh, an element uh, on the mean value of the crime rate, so because clearly this line is the median. So I, I want to uh, add a red dot uh, on, the mean, on the mean value. So I can just use the function points. Uh, and in this case, uh, um, R will consider the, the plot as a sort of, uh, of layer. So it will, it will include other elements on top of, of the plot you created. 
there are two function, two or three functions that can do that. One is the function points, another is the function lines, uh, and clearly one uh, show points and another show lines. Uh, in some uh, plots, there's, there's also the option add. So again, you can add other plots on top of the existing one uh, using the, 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 the option add. <coughs> In this case, I mean, it's not really necessary. And usually, we, we don't really do um, include uh, mean values on, on top of plots. So I just wanted to, to show you how to do it. Uh, for, uh, for points, and, and this function, this, these two options uh, are also available for scatter plots. Uh, so there is an option PCH, which controls the, the symbol that you can use on uh, for the dot, and uh, in this function, you, you have the image on the PDF, um, but basically, uh, depending on the number, it can take uh, any, any symbol you, you want. You, you can actually Im uh, input a symbol if you, if you want. Oh, that was there. So for example, yeah. In this case, I'm using the, the value 16, which is this dot here, but you can use whatever, whatever symbol you like. You can you can also include the symbol yourself. So if it's a plus uh, or whatever, you you can actually use it. And then uh, another option is the option color, which stands for color. So in this in this case, I'm just saying I want the the, the dot to be red. Uh, but again, there are a series of colors you can use in R. Uh, and again, I included uh, a, an image uh, that you can use. So again, you you can input either one of these names or uh, this, this string of characters, and R will, uh, will plot different colors. And again, it's, it's the same with the, uh, the bar chart. So again, if I, if I copy and paste uh, this option in, in the scatter plot I created before, so I, let's say that instead of a, of a dot, I want a series of pluses. Oh yeah, sorry. I input it twice. So now I'm I'm just creating a, the, the same exact scatter plots, but instead of of, uh, of using black dots, I'm just using uh, red plus signs. <coughs> Again, it, it, these are extremely useful, particularly when you have uh, a series of information in the same plot, because clearly, if you want to run a series with uh, dots, a series with uh, with square or whatever, you can use the points and add elements to the plot. Um, the very last thing I wanted to, to show you is how to create uh, multiple uh, box plots. So for example, in this case, in the, in the crime dataset, I have an additional uh, variable, which is uh, I use unemployment. And again, this variable takes either one or zero for high youth unemployment or low youth unemployment. So let's say I want to compare these two groups, OK? Clearly, I, I, because I know that, uh, that the variable crime rate is normally distributed, I could do a bar chart. However, if you are not sure or you know for a fact that uh, the, the variable you want to look at is not normally distributed, uh, the, the best way of actually comparing group is to use uh, box plots. So what you can do to actually create uh, one single box plot for each element of uh, the variable uh, youth unemployment uh, is to actually use a sort of formula. So you use what is called the, the tilde sign, which is the, this, this wiggly sign here. Uh, and then you create a formula. So you, 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 you are basically saying that you want to have a box plot as a function of this other variable, which is youth unemployment. So in this, this um, function will create, instead of one, will create two box plots, which will allow you to actually um, comparing those two distributions. So comparing the median value, comparing the, the interquartile range, et cetera. So clearly, when, if, you, if you just look at these two, uh, what you can conclude is that uh, the, the value of, uh, uh, of uh, i youth unemployment is much lower compared to, uh, to the, the, the other one. So how can you do 
uh, the same thing we did uh, for the, the bar chart. So how can you use the standard error? Um, because again, we are assuming that we are not dealing with a non-normal distribution. So one thing we can do is to add the notches. So the notches uh, are simply based on uh, the standard error of the median. So in this case, uh, is very similar to the standard error of the mean, but it's based on the interquartile range. So the standard error of the median is based on the, the ratio between the interquartile range and the square root of the number of, uh, of values in your data set. <coughs> so again, it can be used the same way. And, and the nice thing about R is that if, if you just include the, the, the option notch true, it will, uh, it will solve the equation. It will create notches based on the, the standard error of the median. So again, we have this uh, crime rate, uh, forgot the dollar sign. So again, the, what, what R does, it creates these two notches, uh, which are these, these two triangular shaped thing here. And the way you interpret those two notches is exactly the same as for the error bars. So because here we, we can clearly see that the two notches, that, so the ranges of the, the standard error of, uh, of the mean are overlapping. Uh, this is the good indication that probably the two group uh, are statistically not different. Okay? So again, it may be because uh, we don't have enough, uh, enough samples. It may be that uh, they are not different, whatever. But this is clearly a good indication that you can use in your report to actually uh, formulate your hypothesis uh, and start explaining what, what you have seen in, uh, in your data. Okay, so this was the the, the, the final um, the final function I wanted to show you for for today. So uh, <coughs> one thing I I included here in the in the report um, is uh, a series of references, particularly um, my OneDrive, and we, we can actually open it. Now, so basically, uh, on my OneDrive, uh, I need to sign it up. Um, as, as part of Harper Adams, you all have access to OneDrive, which is a cloud-based service uh, as part of the Office uh, 365 subscription. Um, and um, and if, you, if you follow this link, uh, it will take you to one of my folder on, on my OneDrive. And this folder, I created a series of subfolder with books about statistics, about uh, time series analysis, about um, ANOVA or whatever. And uh, I also included uh, two uh, video tutorials uh, I created for PACT publishing. Uh, I cannot really share them directly with you because uh, the, the copyright is with PACT. Uh, but I can share them uh, with individual students. So the, the first. Uh, uh, video tutorial, which, is, which should be around three or four hours. It's all about data visualization. Uh, so uh, as I said, the, this, the, the, the sort of plots uh, I use now, they are very basics. Uh, but uh, in R, uh, there are other packages that allow you to, to do uh, more, much more complicated stuff. So one of those two video tutorial is all based on data visualization. Uh, so again, if you are, you are free to actually take it whenever you like. You can just download the whole thing; it's not a problem. Uh, the second video tutorial it's a bit uh, it's a bit larger; it's around six hours, uh, and it's about uh, uh, data analysis in general. So everything we will cover here, more or less, but it's mostly focused on spatial statistics. So it's 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 a bit <coughs> different, but uh, the part about uh, time series analysis and machine learning is there. So again, if we don't have time to actually cover those two parts. Uh, uh, feel free to download the, 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 data, the, the, the video tutorial and do it. So in terms of homework, because they, they actually told me to include some homeworks, I mean, I don't really care if you actually do it, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, it's just a way to, for you to, to play around with that. I mean, uh, uh, clearly, the, the, the assignment, uh, I, I don't know if Sarah actually showed you the, the assignment this morning. But basically, the assignment would be split in two parts. And one of those two parts will be data analysis. 
So we, you will have access to da two data sets, and you will need to, to do a sort of data analysis. So again, justify, uh, create maybe several plots for, for, uh, for formulating the hypothesis and doing whatever, whatever test you, you think is uh, it's appropriate for that particular data set. Uh, so again, because the assignment is due on the 24th of May, before that, if you want to play around with, with the data set I've shown in the, in the lecture or uh, another data set, uh, which is the diet data set, which can be accessed from uh, the, the Sheffield website. If I can open, it would be nice. Um, yes, here. So these are all data sets you can access for free. Um, I mean, clearly, I, I would be, I would be uh, happy to, for you to send me your script with uh, whatever you, you've done. Uh, just play around and, uh, and do whatever you like. Again, I don't expect you to actually turn anything in. If you just want to, if you, if you don't have time, I don't, I don't really mind. Uh, it's, it's up to you. Uh, but you have t if, if you have time and you, and you want to learn more and you want to, to just give me a call and I, I can give you my help and comment on, on your syntax, whatever you want. So again, these are suggestions of, of the type of work you, you can do. Otherwise, again, you, you are free not to do it. All right? So let me... <coughs> 